It was kind of in the, in the waiting room. Okay. You can click on it. Yeah, and it'll come up. Yeah, I'll check. Yeah. So I think I'm just going to open the PowerPoint and then share screen so that it records it as well. Yeah, I'll start record. Yeah. Oh, no, it is recording. It's fine. Okay, well, welcome to the uh, symposium on uh, open science. Um, we'll have five speakers and uh, hopefully about 20 minutes left for discussion at the end. I'll be recording it and uh, live record this on uh, YouTube afterwards, just so you know when you ask uh, questions and so on. First up is Renny. Can you tell us about reproducibility? Hey, everyone. Great. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Rini. I'm a postdoc at Sussex and my time is split between the School of Informatics and the School of Psychology, where I'm working on a project that aims to ensure the computational reproducibility of papers before they're submitted for publication. So first, computational reproducibility can be defined as the ability to uh, rerun the same analysis on the same data set and get the same results as in the original paper, and this extends to all numerical results, figures, tables, and inferential conclusions in the manuscript. While in recent years, we've seen a push towards better open science practices, uh, practices around ensuring computational reproducibility are still lacking. And just one example, in 2016, in this study, uh, researchers across different fields were asked if they've tried to reproduce an experiment before, either someone else's or one of their own. And uh, from the 1,500 or so researchers who completed the survey, 70% said that they've tried to reproduce someone else's experiment and they failed. And around 50% said they've tried to reproduce their own experiment and they failed. Uh, so this is the case. Or, across many different research fields. And this, uh, the, the, the one, I don't know where I'm pointing. So the other research field option at the bottom includes about 50 researchers who said they work in psychology or neuroscience. And from those, 70% said they've either failed to reproduce someone else's experiment or they failed to reproduce their own. So this issue with reproducibility is very much present across all fields of research, including psychology. And you could say that journals are in a position to push for better practices around reproducibility, asking that researchers make sure their studies are reproducible before they send them for publication. And there are some journals that have policies that help ensure reproducibility. Some examples are Metapsychology, the Biometrical Journal, and the American Journal of Political Science. So in all of these journals, when you submit, your paper, you need to provide the code and data to reproduce all of the results. Then your paper goes through a reproducibility check, either done by someone at the editorial board or by some independent researcher as part of the review process. And finally, publication in those journals is uh, contingent on this process of, of successfully reproducing the results in the paper. If you know about the journals that do this, let me know. These are the three I currently know of. And this is great, and these uh, measures do work, but the problem is that most journals don't have such policies. 
For example, uh, science implemented an open data policy in 2011, according to which when you submit a paper, you need to produce, provide all of the data necessary to reproduce the results. But a study from 2018 found that out of 204 randomly sampled articles, only about 26 would be reproducible, even though they were published after this open data policy was implemented. Another example is psychological science, which awards an open data badge uh, to pay papers that provide all of the data needed to reproduce the results in a paper. And in addition to that, as part of the uh, submission process, authors have to confirm that they've provided all the materials needed to reproduce the analysis. And yet in this 2023 study, uh, which examined the first issue in psychological science where all of the papers had an open data badge, out of the 14 articles in that issue, only four were reproducible and only one met the requirements for the badge. And just one final example, this issue with reproducibility is also present in registered reports where standards are already supposed to be better and they are better because people are more devoted to open science practices in when, when they publish registered reports. So in this article, the authors looked at 62 registered reports in the field of psychology published between 2014 and 2018. And out of those articles, so out of 62 articles, only 36 had all the data and code shared with the paper and only 21 were reproducible. And there are many other studies which show similar statistics, similar findings. And the conclusion we can draw from this is that currently most journals do not provide the incentives necessary for people to make sure that their results are reproducible when they publish papers. So what else can we do? Uh, an alternative approach would be to create a demand for better reproducibility practices from within institutions themselves. And this is where this pilot project comes in. So the idea is to establish a process at the School of Psychology here at Sussex, such that people can submit their quantitative papers to a reproducibility check before they send them to journals for publication. And the way it works is that people would make their materials, so their paper, data, analysis pipelines, available to an independent statistician. This is me. I then try and reproduce their results, write a report, and they can reference this report across their manuscript. Uh, taking part in those reproducibility checks is voluntary, and we are very much focused on helping people learn how to improve the reproducibility of their studies, like their, their current studies, and the way that they do their future studies and because it's all optional we are very much trying to lure people in participating by focusing on all of the benefits of taking part which includes standing out when you submit your when you eventually do submit your paper for publication standing out as someone who really cares about open data not in a cynical way but really cares about open data and open science and uh I, hopefully editors would see this as an unusual, very rigorous project process that's currently not very widespread. I don't think there is anything else, any other institution that goes through a process like this. And this would hopefully make you hope, help your paper stand out and to other reviewers and readers as well. The process itself would help correct any errors that might be lurking around, which may influence the results that you've put in your paper and hopefully all of those can be found and corrected before peer review and finally this gives you the confidence that your paper is correct most likely correct there are less, it's less likely there are errors in the data and your analysis pipeline and your uh, manuscript itself and you are more comfortable sharing your things online and the ultimate goal through all of this is that as more and more people see the benefits of taking part, more and more people will ask for their studies to be checked for reproducibility, and that will therefore push the whole field towards just being more mindful of reproducibility and doing, doing better, having better practices around this issue. So now I'll go through our current process for reproducibility certification. Uh, so first, the project is still rather new. So we spend a lot of time informing people that it exists and uh, asking people to volunteer their papers to reproducibility check by highlighting all the all the incredible perks that they're going to get by going through this process. Um, then people who do opt in and send their papers to be checked for reproducibility have to make all of their materials available online. After that, I write an initial report which focuses on all the areas where reproducibility can be improved 
after that, researchers make any changes that they want to the materials, to the manuscript, to the data they've shared. I would then write a final report, which I upload on our OSF page. And finally, people can reference this report if they want to across their uh, manuscript, including in the abstract, like Julia here has said that all of the results in this paper have been certified as computationally reproducible. And the very, very final step of this uh, process is still in development, but we'll ask people who've gone through this for their feedback, what they learned, whether it was useful, what we can improve to make sure that they come back and go through this amazing process again and again and again, every time they have a paper coming out. Uh, so the reproducibility report is divided into seven sections, focusing on different aspects of reproducibility. I'll quickly go through each one, uh, highlighting some example questions. So first we look at what data is shared online. Uh, so we want to know if people have shared the raw data, whether the data is pre-processed in any way before the analysis, whether all of this pre-processing is reproducible, and whether the data is accompanied by a sufficiently clear description of the data. Uh, then the next section is all about where the analysis is conducted. So what software people used, whether they specify the exact version they've used, whether the software is open source, available for download, whether they've specified any additional packages or add-ons that don't come with the base software, and whether all of the versions of these add-ons are specified as well. And the next uh, section focuses on the reproducibility of the analysis itself and how the analysis is conducted. So this would include questions like whether the analysis is code-based, if the code runs without it requiring amendments, if it's legible, so sufficiently commented, organized in a clear, easy to follow way. In case the analysis pipeline is not based on code and requires manual interactions with the software, then whether the analysis pipeline includes a description of how exactly to go through the analysis steps and whether that covers everything, the, all decisions that you need to make while you're doing the analysis. And after that, we get to the bit which people think is all there is, and what, that's whether their numerical results reproduce. So there are a lot of nitpicky questions here around whether you've used random numbers, whether you've specified how you've rounded your values, but essentially the most important question here is whether the reproduced analysis gives the same numerical results as those reported in the manuscript. And, and this is pretty much what people expect is all there is, and they don't realize there are all these other sections which take an insane amount of time to go through. Uh, so after we've analyzed how reproducible the numerical results of a study are, we look at their inferential conclusions. So we check whether the manuscript specifies what rules were used to interpret inferential statistics into conclusions regarding hypothesis, if these rules are implement, implemented as part of the analysis pipeline, so they're machine readable, code-based, and whether when we follow the rules specified in the manuscript and the analysis pipeline, we get the same inferential conclusions as in the manuscript. And then the last two sections focus on whether figures and tables are reproducible and they're pretty similar. So first we wanna know if figures and tables are generated as part of the analysis pipeline or they're generated someplace else, unspecified anywhere. Whether we get, if we follow the way that the tables and figures are generated, whether we get tables and figures that look the same way and whether the data that's represented in them matches what's in the paper. And this is a pretty brief overview of what the report template looks like and the types of questions it covers. It's actually a lot longer than this and very nitpicky and very detailed. And it takes a lot of time to get through it. Um, so I thought I'll share some things that I found while going through this for the last couple of months and some basically some obstacles to reproducibility I've encountered. So one big one is uh, manual input or manual manipulations of data. For example, pre-processing or tidying your data in Excel. Uh, in one study where the authors had done that, it turned out that they had misplaced some values and that ended up snowballing into inferential conclusions, not reproducing. So now they have a bit of extra thinking to do uh, to make sure that their discussion follows the results of the study. Uh, another very common one is uh, using deprecated software. So some, sometimes people use programs which are no longer available or packages which are no longer supported or functions which have either completely disappeared 
or now require new types of input or give slightly different output. So these require just doing some extra coding, changing the analysis pipeline a bit. And that's uh, this, so this and the first, uh, solving this issue and the first issue takes quite a bit of time because it requires going through the analysis pipeline and redoing it in code to make sure that all of those errors uh, go away. Uh, another fun one was a, a manuscript where people used a web application to do part of the analysis, and it turned out that that web, web application had their error in it, and it wasn't it wasn't computing things the way it should be. So now that's a bit of extra work to do. And then some more generic but very important ones include readme files that are not sufficiently detailed. So this is one where I tell every time I write the draft report, I tell people, you need to write more detailed readme file because it's not your data is not sufficiently well described. And people look at what I've suggested they do. They realize it's going to take hours. They don't want to spend their time on this because it's boring and it takes an incredible amount of effort and incredible amount of time for seemingly little value. And um, I, I have so far failed to convince people that they need to spend all of this time to make sure that their data is usable. Um, but yeah, I need, to, I need to figure out how to convince people to put this hours and hours of work of writing readme files in a way that another person can understand what the data is. Because essentially, if, if someone can't understand your data, they can't use it. But unless you've tried to reproduce someone's analysis, you don't know that. So unless I, I give them someone else's start uh, someone else's study and ask them to reproduce it, they wouldn't they wouldn't know that they need to spend all of this time and then a very common one is just errors when ha which happen when you copy paste or round results manually when you're putting your results from your analysis software to your manuscript and this happens a lot when you're tweaking your code and then you're constantly changing small things and you have to constantly go back copy paste paste and you essentially forget to copy paste something and the solution to that is to never copy paste anything and just use our markdown. And I did at one point, it crossed my mind to just redo someone's analysis in an R markdown file. And then I immediately decided not to do it because it would take too long. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the way to go for it. And finally, uh, where is this project now? So when it first started, we, got, we very quickly got a lot of Six papers might not look like a lot, but it is a lot. To get six papers pretty much within a space of a week, it's quite a lot of uh, demand. And they're all very different studies. So they include four behavioral studies across a variety of fields, an fMRI study and an EG study. So there is quite a lot of expertise you need to be able to reproduce all of those. Um, currently, there is one completed report that's already on OSF. One and a half draft reports are back with the authors and I'm waiting for them to make revisions. The half is half the behavioral half of the EG study. I haven't started the EG bit yet. And I'm currently working on two more reports which should be done by the end of July. And then I was trying to think how long it takes me to do one of those and I'm pretty sure I'm underestimating, but I would say that a draft report takes around a week to do. Then it can take less if people have gone through the, uh, checklist and they've made sure that everything they shared is in the best possible stage that it can be and I can just go and say yes 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 perfect if it's not then it takes progressively longer the more things have gone wrong and then the final report can either take seconds to do if everything was already fine with the draft report or it can take a few days again if I need to go back and recheck that things have been uh, fixed and now everything is completely different so that's about it um thank you for listening um yes questions yes go to of course three people are waiting i'm so sorry all right any questions hi um so maybe this is really more like technical stuff in the Suppose you've got something like a PG where the customer code is a certain block. Yes. Would you check that the results you produce using that code? Um, yes. And what was customer code in the book? I would cry. Mm -hmm. So every every time I have to have bugs in my own code, which I find. 
Yeah, so I wouldn't write it independently. If code already exists, I would try to make that code run. The only the only situation where I would write code is if it doesn't exist and it will take me less time to write the code than to try and follow the steps as described in a Word document. So is is it a cycle? So it should be doing the same thing with the same data. So rerunning the analysis as it was originally done on the same data. So if someone did all of their analysis in Excel, I would not, I refuse. <laughs> I thought I would be able to do it and then I tried and then I made a mistake within the first like thing I selected. I'm like, no, it's not gonna work. But I've shared the code with the people, the code that I wrote so that they can use it if they want to. And you can still essentially get to the situation where the output is reproducible, but the way you got there might be different. So you can't say that the way they've done it initially is reproducible, but you can say you get the same thing. So that end result is. It further to Max's point, that it's actually better that way, isn't it? Yes. So, yeah. um, I mean, what those journals do is like just get the code, they run it, get set it off, bang, job done. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily show the code does what it's meant to do. No. Yeah, that's so. true. Yes, thanks. That's very interesting. Uh, and the massive amount of work. Yes. <laughs> and in the same, you know, the, the research is washing their hands of the reproducible and yeah. handing it away to you. So they wouldn't agree. My question was the spoken confidence approach versus motivating researchers to write their papers in our heart now from the outset. I think in a lot of cases, people don't just don't know how to use certain things. And uh, with this approach, we're giving them the incentive of, look, you can add, oh, the dog is back. Sorry. <laughs> so um, we give them the incentive of, oh, you can, you can advertise that you've gone through this process. Someone has done this. You've been extra rigorous compared to other people. And at the same time, we, we try and help them. I, mean, I, I give them suggestions of what to improve next time to make things better and better. So someone who's done their entire analysis in Excel, I wouldn't throw our markdown at them directly, but I'll give them my R code and like, these are things you can do next time. Try and do that. Um, and I think at this stage, we can't really, we're trying to get an interest and hype around the project so that it can live on for longer. And we can, we can demand of people like, send me an R markdown file or I won't look at it. And then no one sent it to me. So it's we're in this in-between position where we're trying to generate interest, but also be welcoming and nice. I mean, interesting on that point. Um, I heard a talk used to be about five years ago from American Journal, which is well, they basically do what you say, they, they play to some script, as you said. But in that talk, then they said, even though the authors know that the place will be checked, it's just they run the script. They found an error in so at least this one error in any way. Yeah. So, so I mean, leaving people to do it themselves, I, I think, is a bit different than getting an independent person to do it. And that's kind of usually the job. I, I also spoke to someone from Metapsychology last week, and from the papers that they've reproduced last year, I think they did 12. Only two managed, they managed to reproduce only two without any errors. And that's, again, in a journal where, where you're submitting it, you know you're going to be going through this. And they have the checklist and they know what they're going to be going through. Yes. Yeah. Really Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, do you have also enough uh, energy to look into uh, um, the soundness of the decisions in the mm -hmm. analytical uh, pipeline? For example, in the, the code is, is okay, we produce it, but the decisions during the analysis were wrong. So can you look into, for example, I don't know, for example, outlier uh, detection is wrong or, so yeah, is there a way? To... So if someone has said, for example, we're going to exclude, uh, we're going to define outliers as everything beyond two standard deviations yeah. of A, so, yeah. and then in the code they're doing 2.5. No, then I, I would be or, like, or maybe uh, doing doing it um, um, on the whole. I don't know. Just doing the wrong statistics. Yeah, yeah, doing wrong statistics. Yeah, yeah. So in that case, uh, because 
I think when we advertise the project to people, we specifically say, I'm not going to be judging whether their stats are correct and their approach is correct. But I do say, I, I have, if you'd like, I've, I've gone through this, I have thoughts. I can share my thoughts if you'd like, and then people decide if they want to say yes or no. All right. And then I'll share what I what I think if they if they. So you actually have. I have thoughts. Yes. No, no, no. It's very nice to do that uh, as well. To look into the uh, decision. Well, kind of, it's kind of inevitable. It springs out to you. Right. Okay. I, I think. Probably better move on. Okay. Good. Um. Right. Later. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> Um, okay. Of course, yes. Jamie. So we don't see the waiting room people when we're presenting. Okay. Okay. All right, Rob. Hi, Zoltan. Um, a message for the live speakers. I think you need to share your slides in order for them to be seen on Zoom. So we, we, we saw the speaker, but not the slides for the last talk. You... No. What? <laughs> We shared screen, but it didn't come up. Uh, I I didn't see anything. I don't think Karina did either. No, okay. <laughs> no, okay, we'll check for the next live speaker, which will be me, we'll, we'll, we'll check that. Okay, over to Rob McIntosh, the Open Research Officer of the British uh, Neuropsychological Society, to tell us about registered reports. Okay, uh, well, thanks very much, Zoltan. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's great to be invited to take part in this Open Science Symposium. I'm really sorry I can't be there in person today, but circumstances have intervened as they are wont to do. Um, I'm speaking as a representative of the British Neuropsychological Society, specifically the Open Research Officer. Uh, and I'd like to talk about an issue that we think is of really high importance for neuropsychologists trying to engage with open research practices. Um, and I should say at the outset that in this context, I'm talking about neuropsychology to refer to the traditional method of studying brain behavior relationships, whereby we study the behavior and cognition of people with damage or disease or, you know, developmental divergence uh, affecting the brain or nervous system. Uh, and the issue that we think is of high importance for engagement with open science is that around registered reports. Um, now, I'm pretty sure that I don't need to tell this audience uh, what registered reports are, uh, but briefly, it's an innovative empirical format been developed over the last decade, decade or so in which uh, peer review and the editorial process is focused upon a stage one plan for a manuscript. Um, and that plan represents the detailed rationale and the plan for the study before the method before the study has actually been carried out. Um, this format's been closely associated with Chris Chambers, who's worked tirelessly to develop and champion this model, uh, starting from his original launch of the format at Cortex in 2013. Uh, and both myself and Zoltan have been fairly closely involved in uh, registered reports initiatives since the inception of the format back then. Uh, the central feature of the format, of course, is that it decouples evaluations of scientific quality uh, and publication decisions dependent on that from any knowledge of results. Uh, and it also forces authors to really specify all their hypotheses, methods and analysis pipeline in advance. So they have to nail everything down to remove analytic flexibility. So at a stroke, this policy immediately eliminates the most pernicious sources of biases that might affect the scientific literature. Uh, because the results are unknown when the decision to publish is made. Uh, it eliminates publication bias on the part of the journals and on the part of the authors, because it locks down all the methodological aspects and analytic decisions. It removes all that kind of undisclosed flexibility where the murky stuff can happen. Uh, so it prevents practices like p-hacking, selective reporting or hypothesizing after the results are already known. Uh, and this all amounts to the central core benefit of the format of registered reports, which is an unbiased reporting and publication of results. And that's the core thing that registered reports achieves and is designed to achieve. Uh, and we know that it achieves it uh, due to various bits of meta science. Um, this is a nice example from Anne Sheel and colleagues, uh, which conveys just kind of what the scale of the benefit here is in terms of bias. So the purple bars on this plot represent the percentage of a sample of psychology standard research articles and registered reports from matched journals 
in which the first hypothesis of the paper was confirmed by a statistically significant result. And you can see that only around 44% of registered reports hypotheses were supported, meaning that the other 66% came out null. Uh, and that's what we might expect if the format really is effective in eliminating publication bias. Actually, the most shocking and striking thing about this plot is just how absurdly extreme the publication bias is within the standard reports. Uh, more than 95% positive findings in favor of the first experimental hypothesis here, which is just absurd. Um, so that's at the core of what registered reports do. Uh, they eliminate bias. But there's also considerable positive side effects, what we might call collateral benefits associated with the format. Uh, so as an editor of both standard and registered reports, I can attest that the review process for registered reports tends to be quite a bit more constructive and collaborative. And this arises pretty naturally because the authors don't have to be too defensive. They can work freely with the reviewers to adjust and optimize a study design rather than having to try and fight some kind of rearguard action to protect a finished study against criticism. Uh, and there's also some initial encouraging evidence that the format has got wider benefits for methodological rigor. So here's some data from Soderberg and colleagues looking at uh, the ratings provided by blinded raters, uh, rating registered reports relative to standard reports, and across a range of different criteria, the blinded raters provided consistently higher evaluations of rigor and quality for the registered over the standard reports. So that's encouraging. Um, a key aspect of this methodological rigor comes down to a central issue, which is power, statistical power or sensitivity or standard of evidence if you're using a Bayesian approach. Um, a key aspect of registered reports then is that they're required typically to be very highly powered. Uh, Cortex kind of set the template for this initially by requiring uh, authors to demonstrate they had 0.9 power or higher using an alpha criterion of 0.02 or that they have equivalently, you know, or an equivalently stringent Bayesian criterion for the strength of evidence. Uh, and other journals that have adopted registered reports have also tended to follow suit and make similarly kind of stringent requirements on authors. Um, we can see how this uh, has spread across journals. Uh, this is a nice review article from Chris Chambers and Lucia Savella. Um, and they included this figure, which charts really quite remarkable spread of registered reports since its inception at Cortex in 2013. Um, when they published this, you know, in 2020, there were 275 journals had adopted it, and that total is now at well over 300 journals with the noticeable addition of Nature to the list of adopters in February of this year, and they, of course, have appropriately stringent requirements for the standard of evidence. But this kind of graphic here just illustrates the spread of the format across journals, uh, of course, but even having 300 journals on board would be of limited value unless people are actually using the format, that is, unless people are actually publishing registered reports in those journals. Uh, so to take a look at this, I decided to run a quick audit uh, in the editorial records of Cortex, focusing on papers accepted for publication in the last five years. And so I've plotted the main results here. The red bars are the article count for the standard research reports. The green and the blue bars are two more niche formats that we also offer at Cortex that otherwise follow the traditional standard non-pre-registered model. Uh, these are behavioral neurology articles and single case reports. And you can see from this plot that the vast majority of papers published in Cortex are standard research reports. Uh, the counts for registered reports in purple is uh, similar to those for the other minority formats. Uh, although actually last year was the first year that registered reports broke the 10% barrier. Uh, that may or may not be significant, of course. So what we're looking at is that 10 years after launching this format at Cortex, registered reports is really securely established, but it's still a minority format, although there's some possible indications that it's on the rise. And next, I wanna focus on what kinds of research is appearing in the different article types. And specifically, I'm interested in whether the research concerns normal, healthy people or neuropsychological samples, that is people with brain damage, disease or developmental divergence. Uh, so the y-axis on this plot is now no longer counts. It's the percentage of papers within each category. And the purple bar shows what percentage is using neuropsychological rather than normal samples, broadly defined. Um, 
I guess unsurprisingly, because these formats, behavioral neurology and single case reports are designed for the publication of patient-based work, uh, we've got 100% of articles in those formats using neuropsychological samples. But you can see that even around 40% of the standard research reports also use neuropsychological samples. And so what that means overall, combining across these traditional non-pre-registered empirical types, um, around 50% of the empirical output of cortex uh, reports neuropsychological research using brain damage or neurodegeneration um, samples. So, um, you know, that's in keeping with the journal's history as a premier outlet for neuropsychological research. And so what I was interested in doing is comparing uh, registered reports. Now, in order to get a decent sized sample of registered reports, I just took all the registered reports that have ever been published in Cortex since the uh, format was launched. And that's a total of 62. Um, and the contrast here is absolutely stark. So only 2% of these registered reports use neuropsychological samples. Um, and the 2% there is really just a convenient rounding up because what that bar really reflects is that there's only ever been one neuropsychological registered report published in Cortex in the 10 years that the Cortex has, uh, that the format's been in existence. Uh, and here is that exceptional paper. This is the first author, uh, Stacey Humphreys, the BNS member who she came and reported her experience of registered reports to the BNS Society's autumn meeting last year. And she had some really positive things to say about the editorial and review process. But nonetheless, it's clear that the study was something of a Herculean slog, despite the fact that Parkinson's disease is a relatively common neuropsychological condition. Uh, the agreed stage one sampling plan for this study was to test 50 patients with Parkinson's disease and 50 healthy controls. They actually fell slightly short of this target, having exhausted the available participant pool after testing 44 patients. Uh, and actually, this level of recruitment took nearly two years as you can deduce from the dates between which uh, in-principle acceptance was awarded and then the final two, stage two submission being made in August 2019. At the same BNS symposium where we heard about Stacey's experience, we also heard from Nila Denier, involved a stage one IPA from Cortex for a stroke-based study that has yet to be completed. Uh, this study aims to replicate and test the generality of a really famous finding on implicit processing in neglect which was published originally by John Marshall and Peter Halligan in 1988. This is the famous Burning House study, which I'm sure you probably heard of. Uh, the original Nature paper was based on 30 data points collected from a single patient with neglect. And the sampling plan for this registered report involves more than 90 patients with 255 trials each. So that's quite an extreme difference in the scale of the empirical undertaking that we're talking about here. Unfortunately, the project didn't get off to the best of starts. IPA was awarded just as the UK went into its first COVID lockdown in March 2020. Uh, but we're now more than three years in and actually less than half of the sample have been tested so far. Um, they're still going ahead with this, uh, but the research team's undergone a few personnel changes, postdocs and PhD students have moved on and so forth. So again, this is a really Herculean effort. So these experiences and the general scarcity of registered reports in neuropsychology should hopefully persuade you that there are real challenges for this format um, for neuropsychological researchers. And probably the main one of these is that just neuropsychological data are incredibly expensive in terms of time and resources required for recruitment, finding time to test the patients, and the number of trials you can expect to get at a given session. And, you know, each data point in neuropsychology, I would say, is probably equivalent to thousands in normal research. And the high power requirements of registered reports mean that sample sizes become prohibitively large. And it's also the case that for single case studies, high power may be inherently unachievable. And that's a different problem, which I'm not going to discuss in any detail today, but it also affects neuropsychological researchers trying to engage with registered reports. Um, it's also possible that this scientific imperative to have as high power as possible is in tension with clinical considerations, which may seek to minimize the patient burden in terms of research participation. So the requirements for large sample sizes are obviously onerous just in terms of the number of patients you need to test. Uh, and that's got you know, massive implications in terms of the likely timescale of a project, even if that sample size is considered to be ultimately achievable. 
that the, there might be relatively few research groups that have got the stability or the resources to really stay the course for a full scale RR process of this sort. You know, it can be a struggle to complete even a single study within the lifetime of the PhD or of a research grant. Uh, and that's not even factoring in the lead time that you might need to obtain clinical ethical approvals to run the study in the first place. So, you know, if any of you have made a major NHS ethics application recently, then you'll probably know that that can take a year or even more to get those ethical approvals in place. And this kind of onerous ethics screening is kind of antithetical to the registered report stage one review process, because it may leave very little scope to respond flexibly to reviewer feedback by modifying a protocol, because that protocol's already been effectively locked down by the ethical committee. So any substantive change that you wanted to make to the protocol at that stage would entail a major ethical amendment. And again, if you're familiar with dealing with the wonderful world of NHS ethics, you'll know that that is a loop you definitely want to stay out of. So for those accustomed to registered reports in the context of normal samples, the stage one review process is often really one of trying to sort of perfect and optimize the ideal study design. And you, know, you can be flexible and take into account the considerations raised by reviewers. Uh, but we know that working with patient samples often entails a really high degree of compromise. And you've got to strike a balance between the study that you might ideally like to run uh, and what is practically achievable in context. So this triad of challenges of power, time scale, and flexibility creates a baby bathwater dilemma. Registered reports offer a really valuable core benefit of an unbiased or substantially less biased literature, but we may be unable to meet other common requirements for the format in terms of power and optimal design, and that threatens to make the format inaccessible to neuropsychological researchers, unless we can find a way to give up on some or all of these collateral features in order to access this core benefit of unbiased publication. So what solutions can we propose here? Well, fortunately, we don't really need to invent any new wheels because the groundwork's been well laid by the wonderful platform of peer, com uh, peer communities and registered reports. Uh, two of our speakers today are on the founding board of PCI RR and Karina Logan will be telling you much more about this platform in her talk. Uh, it briefly, it's an academic run journal independent non-profit platform for the review and editorial recommendation of stage one and stage two registered reports. And the default criteria for PCI RR is that scientific quality um, is what matters. Okay, so these default criteria contain some of the ingredients that we may need to open the format up to neuropsychological research. And that's firstly because it sets no minimum level of power to qualify as being of high scientific quality. Uh, there's no minimum standard of evidence, only that the design should be sound and the study capable of making a worthwhile contribution to the field. Um, so if we apply that sensitively and with disciplinary knowledge, this policy potentially allows for field sensitive evaluations of what constitutes worthwhile research given the challenges of a certain discipline. Second, PCI RR formalizes the idea that registered reports could be run at different levels of bias control. So the canonical RR, of course, is one where the stage one review process is completed before any of the data exist. And that corresponds to a bias control level of six, and that basically eliminates all possible sources of potential bias but five other levels are defined below this. And at level four or lower, some or even all of the data can exist already at the point that the stage one IPA is awarded. And the primary motivation for introducing these lower levels of bias control was actually to make the format accessible to studies that want to do secondary data analyses where the data already exists by definition. Uh, but a side effect of this is that it becomes possible in principle to make stage one submissions for a primary empirical study where some of the data already exists because the study may already be underway. And that provides a possible mechanism for neuropsychological researchers to engage with registered reports without elongating the timescale of the project to ridiculous extents. Of course, if the study has already been started, then the reviewers will only be able to suggest amendments to analysis plans, not to the data collection methods. So it'll be more about ratifying the scientific quality of an existing protocol rather than aiming to perfect uh, the study. 
But of course, you know, that's also necessary if the protocol for a clinical project has already been locked down by a clinical ethics committee. So PCIRR has perhaps prepared the ground for wider engagement with registered reports for neuropsychologists. Uh, but what happens next? Well, when a completed stage two registered report has received a recommendation from the platform, the authors have several options. And I'm sure Karina will go on to describe some of these. But for the moment, I'm just going to assume that the authors wish to convert that recommendation into a formal publication in a journal within their field of expertise. And this is where we hit some potential problems. So one feature of PCIRR is that authors are able to place their recommended article automatically into any of a number of journals that have signed up with PCIRR friendly status. These journals have agreed to publish any recommended report without further review, but only if certain conditions are met. And that's specifically that the article has to fall within their disciplinary scope and that the standard of evidence and level of bias are consistent with whatever that journal has specified for its registered reports track. Uh, Cortex was in the first wave of PCIRR friendly journals, and that's great for neuropsychologists, except that the very stringent power requirements that it operates uh, mean that the format may be inaccessible to them. Similarly, other in-scope journals that are signed up to the scheme, they may have slightly lower, but still potentially prohibitive requirements. Uh, there are several journals that are in principle more flexible, but they're either more general psychology journals or general science journals. And so they might be less attractive as a destination venue than the more field specific options. We look outside the PCIRR process then, and we just look to see which neuropsychological journals are offering their own registered reports track. Well, there are some potential candidates like experimental brain research and brain communications who have no officially defined minimum level of evidence or bias, uh, but it remains to be seen to what extent the relevant editors are understanding of the specific challenges of neuropsychological research. As far as I can tell, uh, there's been no registered reports published in either of those places yet. Uh, and most of the other traditional neuropsychological journals don't even have a registered reports track. Okay, so to conclude, what we have so far is not a developed solution, but we certainly have the seeds of a path towards greater engagement with registered reports in neuropsychology. First, we can harness the excellent flexible features of PCIRR's model to allow a field sensitive evaluation of a study scientific value, which is not based on restrictive power requirements and is potentially even flexible about the level of bias control. And if we wanted to make this happen within PCIRR itself, and there are good reasons that we might want to do that, then we need to try and build up a strong contingency of neuropsychological expertise there by encouraging colleagues to join as recommenders and reviewers. Uh, we also need to work to educate and lobby relevant journals to adjust their registered reports requirements to be more accommodating to neuropsychological work and ideally to sign up to become PCIRR friendly journals themselves. Uh, and finally, of course, we need to raise awareness amongst researchers and clinicians that this viable pathway uh, exists towards a less biased neuropsychological literature. Okay, and I would hope that events like this symposium represented uh, you know, a good step in that direction. So um, thanks to the organizers for giving me the chance to speak and to represent the BNS here. Uh, and thanks to you for listening, even though I'm not in the room, uh, assuming of course that you did. Thanks. Any questions? Yes, David. Um, very interesting talk. Can you hear me, Robert? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, I, I wonder if the problem isn't isn't slightly different. Um, it, it's that you know, in order to do a registered report, you have to be a neuropsychologist, and neuropsychologists suspect that the large majority of their findings are unreproducible. And that's why they don't do them. And I mean, I'd say, I mean, I say that flippant, but you know, the reality is that the textbook depiction of things like neglect and amnesia and blindsight it rests enormously on extremely rare 
individual cases. I mean, even, even if those individual cases are accurately described, they, they're extraordinarily rare and not representative of the majority of patients with that particular form of brain injury. Yes, so I, I think what you're talking about really there are single case, the single case approach to neuropsychology, uh, which I briefly alluded to, but I, I didn't have time to get into today. And I think that that has really significant um, issues uh, for registered reports. And in fact, for the whole null hypothesis significance testing approach in general, um, I think that those kind of studies are great for hypothesis generation. Uh, and but as you say, they're not reproducible and they can't, I don't think they can participate in kind of the normal generation of evidence that we would want to see in science. But I don't think that that is true of uh, group studies in neuropsychology. I think that there are a lot of things that are going to be reproducible at a group level. And I think that actually what we should be striving for is a science where we find out what is reproducible. Um, so there's a lot that can be done um, within a registered report context that would constitute re reproducible research, I think. And these kind of unicorn patients, uh, I think really are in the realm of hypothesis generation and we should treat them that as inherently by nature, more exploratory form of research, which, which you're right, would not be suitable for registered reports. Any other question before I move on? Hopefully there'll be a little bit of time at the end for. Okay, I want to um, sort of change the level of focus in terms of um, what the problem is. Um, with the credibility crisis that we've we've recognised, I think it was starting about ten years ago, but really has been sort of there for a long time, um, to the level of the institution. So there's what individual scientists do, but then there's the institutional practices uh, and ways that universities are governed. And one hypothesis is the credibility crisis may be reason in part because of how universities are governed. Um, it's hard to get um, sort of rock-hard evidence for that. But on the other hand, there's some considerations that um, in the past 20 years or so, there's been a, a strong rise in man managerialism in universities. And managerialism means that you assess the worth of person within an institution in terms of the ability to achieve certain key performance indicators that are defined by management. Now, within academia, I mean, this is part of a, a, a sort of a, a, a larger change in society, um, new public management. Britain is associated with Margaret Thatcher trying to reform the civil service and state-funded institutions as a way of implementing a, sort of a market economy where you don't actually have competition in market economy. So you, you, you try and set it up. So you create those same conditions by evaluating people by key performance indicators, and then they people can thus compete for prestige jobs and so on. Now within academia, those key performance indicators are largely journal impact factors, the number of outputs you produce, which achieve high journal impact factor, um, and uh, grant income. Now, journal impact factor has been found to be uh, zero to negatively correlated with, with methodological rigor once you're above a, a GIF of about two. And in terms of grand income, uh, as, as something, as soon as you reward that for itself, that that input to the research process becomes the very thing that you're uh, that you're valuing as a, as an end in itself. Smoldino and McElreath ran simulations where they uh, set up a uh, sort of an ecology of different labs competing for, for grants. Uh, and they presume that um, you just need to make this assumption that if you p-hack, in other words, you can, you, you can um, um, 
you can shortcut quality, but in a way that makes results look good. Uh, those labs will, as long as there's some tendency for such labs to, to get more outputs and things that get them the grant income, then those labs will have more progeny in terms of the PhD students and postdocs that they produce. Uh, progeny that will acquire the culture of the lab and hence there'll be natural selection process for peak hacking. So that follows from fairly uh, sort of uncontroversial assumptions, I think. So what follows from those considerations is managerialism at university level situated in the dysfunct dysfunctional ecosystem that we happen to be in, selects for p-hacking salespeople. Um, and you, you might know about the, uh, the rat tails Hanoi, which is sort of an illustration of this process. So at the end of the colonial era in, in, uh, of France in Vietnam, um, the French noticed there were a lot of rats about and they wanted to get rid of them. So they thought, so that the KPI, the key performance indicator, they, they said to the, to, the, to the locals, if you give us rat tails, we'll pay you for each rat tail that you get. So the metric was rat tails. And then that result of that was an increase in the number of rats. Because the locals being resourceful types set up rat farms. So I, I mean, there's a general fear with metrics when they use any metric, when it's used in a top-down way as the as, as the main thing that you're measuring, is in effect you create rat farms. So the fear is that that's exactly what's happened in academia. And I think um, one way of looking at that is, especially in the UK around about 20 years ago, and I think earlier in the US and uh, Australia, um, we universities went over from a, a governance process, which was really sort of um, democratically run guild of scholars to complete, complete top-down control in most universities within the UK, not all of them, but most of them, most of them. So now the way decisions, but the science itself isn't, a hierarchical process of what some person says as higher up, you obey them. At least that's not the ideal of science. It might happen like that in some labs, but that's not the reason why science works when it works. When that happens in science, where somebody takes control, becomes a gatekeeper, says you must believe this, that's science malfunctioning and is not explaining why knowledge grows at all. So what, what we have is a, is a mismatch between the way university, the decision-making process within universities and the way science runs. And that's kind of strange for two reasons. Uh, one is I think that science works best when it's embedded in a culture that respects the values of science itself. Uh, so um, if you look at the sort of the history of the growth of knowledge and science and, and political history, science tends to go with democracy, for example. There's a sort of synergy between them. There's also another point that if science is one of our most amazing creations and you, and you look at the, the way decisions and judgments are made within science, you might think that would have something to say about good ways of making decisions. And I think it does, uh, we can think of it in terms of uh, maximizing in, uh, information integration, which is, I think, the way science does, which is when you have many voices, all of which can be heard and, and, and can information from the different viewpoints can be combined because it's an open democratic process by which uh, uh, information is put forth, criticisms are made, and uh, decisions are made. So consider an institution. Uh, I think each academic has information about how the university is working. An institution is a big place and it will work in different, you know, there'll be different problems and different issues in different corners of it. So different people have different relevant information. But that information isn't going to be um, expressed in any useful way unless it can be used to make decisions. And also those decisions will make best use of the information if the people making the decisions have to live by them. And also I think in science, what we do is ultimately, I know we select people sometimes, but ultimately we're selecting ideas, not people. 
So what 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 we really want is a is a is a is a sort of a, a, a mechanism that considers and selects ideas rather than considers and selects people. Now there was such a, a process uh, about 500 BC ish, 2,500 years ago in classical Athens, where the from the citizens there were there were ten uh, sort of fairly artificially defined tribes. Um, random selection from those tribes, uh, 50 from each tribe, um, each year produced the council, which was the main executive body. Um, one tribe each month was the main agenda setting uh, group for that, for that month within, within the council. One person was randomly selected to be the leader, the nominal leader, each day. So within the university, that'd be like having a different VC every day. They would, uh, people could, could put proposals, anybody could put a proposal to the Boulay, to this, to this council for them to consider. If the, the, the council would then set an agenda for the assembly of citizens, all citizens, maybe something like 60,000 could, could then vote on. And then they introduced after about 400 uh, BC, the nomothetai, which was a random selection of citizens that were considered the decisions that had just been made and reflect on them and their relationship to the laws that are already in place to make sure that they're consistent and that they thought that these new suggested laws had just been voted on were actually good. And it was only if they passed this further test that they then became laws. So this whole, this whole system was one of constant circulation of people so that decisions emerged from people as a whole. And so therefore, would I think, you could think of it as maximally integrating the information that's available in the society as a whole in order for these decisions to be made. Now, some people like Pericles may have had persuasive arguments, but that's fine. Pericles wasn't the leader. He didn't, he didn't make the decisions. He could make arguments. Anybody could make arguments in the assembly and sway people one way or the other. That's fine. But what was selected in the end were ideas, not people. Now, the reason why I bring this up is A, that it's uh, inspired open democratic procedures that have been well tested in the political arena already for the past several decades. And also, I just want to say, this sounds kind of fantastic. But remember, it existed for a couple of hundred years, and it outcompeted economically and culturally in terms of the uh, explosion of knowledge and culture that, that came out of it. Uh, other Greek states in an ecosystem of about a thousand Greek states, which had a range of different political um, ways of governing, including tyranny with complete top-down control or oligarchy with, with, a, with a group of... Uh, the best, if you like, or you know, good people ruling. Uh, Joshua Ober shows in his 2015 book, if you look at the archaeological evidence, that the democracies outcompeted these other forms of governance. So if, if anybody ever says to me that that just sounds a bit ridiculous, I say it worked for 200 years. So just because things have been a certain way in universities and society for us, it doesn't mean it has to be that way. And we don't have to follow our 10 close nearest neighbors, you know, whenever you go to some management group meeting or something, I say, let's look at our 10 closest competitors and try and copy them. As if that would enable us to outcompete them by copying them. So here's an example of a process, um, the deliberative poll, which is like the Citizens Assembly that was inspired by the Athenian model and has been tested for several decades now. Randomly select people from, um, maybe you want to make a decision for a city or this has been applied to the whole of Europe or Australia or Ireland or um, township, whatever it is, randomly select two to 300 people, put them into groups of 15, and they're given information packs, maybe some issue that um, you want them to consider. Uh, what should the council spend the money on? Council was drawn up to the 30 proposals in a township in China, for example, this, this, uh, this was done. Um, 
if there's competing points of view, uh, like two main camps, each camp presents an information pack for, for, their, for their arguments. The, the people have been randomly selected, so they've got no special acts to grant. They're just random, random people. They debate, and there's a moderator that makes sure the debate focuses on arguments, that everyone has a chance to have the turn, no one dominates the conversation, uh, and arguments don't get personal, they focus on the arguments themselves rather than people. Then after, say, in the case of a deliberative poll, it's a, it's a meeting for a couple of days, uh, they anonymously vote. So this, is, this, this has been used across, across the globe in, to make all sorts of decisions. And it's been found that when the deliberative poll does this, uh, indeed, they, they, uh, their opinions change uh, because of this process of voting. They become more well-informed. Uh, and generally, they make good decisions. So I suggested we could use this process in this Royal Society Open Science article uh, in the university. I mean, most the, the simplest thing to do, and the first thing which I think would which would be hard to argue against, is you just you just say to your vice chancellor, let's set up something like a citizens' assembly to make a decision for the institution as a whole. Just any any any. Any uh, decision that your institution is considering, it could have been before the pension issue was resolved, uh, what would be the university sciences, science and pension? Or our VC is thinking about creating what we have now is uh, senior management and then um, a, a dozen schools underneath it, a faculty structure, say four faculties in between. Okay. Should we change to this faculty structure? She could set up a something like a citizens assembly or deliberative poll, this sort of sort of mini public, and then trust the people that you randomly select from the university that they're intelligent people capable of making decisions. That when you give them relevant information and they debate it for a couple of days, that they will bring to bear lots of different viewpoints, and I think probably make better decisions than management can make, which is just one sort of bubble of person with one sort of perspective, which cannot integrate the information across the whole university in a way that you can get from randomly selecting people from all different corners of the university to get the diverse viewpoints, which would increase the quality of decision-making. What you would gain from that, if you did this process well, I think is incredible goodwill towards any VC and senior management who did this for a major institutional decision, solving one of the main problems we have within many universities across the world, which is an us and them uh, mentality and, and demoralization because of the, the hierarchical top down control that exists. And if that was successful, one could then try and broaden the process. So, this is say, uh, Sussex, we have senior management. They tell the deans what to do, the deans tell the schools what to do. That's how it's been for um, 15 years or so. Prior to that, we were relatively more democratic. Well, um, an easy change is you keep the same committee structure and so on that already exists in the institution, but you just, as in the Athenian case, you randomly select vice petition uh, into the committees. You do away with senior management. And then the the the, uh, um, the committees just make the decisions as they normally do. You could add in uh, mini publics, as I as I uh, as I said, um, the executive committee can make proposals to them. The mini publics make decisions, or the mini publics could decide on agendas as well. They could decide on could either give them agendas for them to make decisions on, or they could they could propose agendas for an executive committee to to decide. You could add an assembly of citizens if, if you wanted, uh, and proposals could be given to the citizens of the university as a whole. And there's, there's another sort of mini public that's been used, a citizen initiative review I put up there, where you get something like a deliberative poll. This is before you have a referendum, and this has been tried and, and became uh, part of the way Oregon simply does things uh, for, its, for its referendum. So, Problem with referenda is that the uh, public don't really know the issues. They're not informed. Consider Brexit. People just told a bunch of lies and it's waiting people and you, you get some god awful outcome. 
But let's say you don't do it that way. Let's say what happens is, say in the Brexit case, you, you give a random selection of people the arguments like in the deliberative poll. They have an argument, a, a debate about it. They write down what do they think are the chief pros and cons and they vote. And then they write an information pack about the, the, the main arguments they felt, the pros and the cons and, and how they voted. And that information pack then goes out to the, to the citizens before they vote in a referendum. That way you're getting unbiased information about how normal people think if they had reflected for, for you to vote. So then you'd, what you'd have is a self-organizing system with no senior management um, that would have some costs. We would all be involved in the decision-making process, which is something we tried to avoid hard. No one likes admin. But by handing over our responsibility in that respect to say other sort of senior management that we just rolled over and let this top-down control happen because we thought, oh yeah, I don't want to get involved. But look at the result. Are you really happy with that? And are we, in effect, eroding the very integrity of our science by allowing that to happen? All right. I'll stop there and take any questions. Yes. I really like the idea. And, Thanks. Uh, I'm telling more that we try to do follow some of my scenarios. Uh -huh. But uh, my question is how it would come back to the credibility crisis. So mm. then, how I see is that um, it is not necessarily the institute's decision whether they incentivize uh, proactivity or uh, a number of articles and all that factors. So mm. Often uh, coming from further. From higher level, yeah, um, yeah, from uh, schemes or national, um, in our case, ref, yeah, so yeah that drives, uh, yeah, international ranking systems, and, and so, mm. so yes, hard to change from. So that's not the top of the level. No, so I mean, institutions, just as we're situated with institutions, they give incentives structures to us the institutions are situated within uh, an ecosystem of right. national and governance and international yeah so there's lots of levels in which we have to tackle the credibility crisis um i i think the problem becomes acute though when you have senior management because if you think of just what a what do you think your job is you you've been appointed to be a senior manager uh, what is it that you think you're going to do? This, the sort of demand characteristics of the situation that sort of immediately suggests to you what it is. Oh, I've got to work for the university rankings. I've got to build up our, uh, you know, our, our, our level in, in university rankings. I've got, to, I've got to build up our, our ref. That becomes practically the only viable goal that they can have because that's what, what else they're, they're getting paid for with this, this normal salary. So they're almost... So when you have what we have as a separate senior management uh, um, sort of class, or set of people or jobs, uh, the demand characters of the, situ of the situation almost demand that they focus on KPIs. Because that will also be by maximizing KPIs as best they can, will get them the next job at a better paid university. Now, if we were a set of, if we were sort of self-organizing open, open democracy, we'd still feel the same pressures in terms of the larger ecosystem of, of, of which we are a part, that's, that's true. But I'm not so sure we would succumb or believe that simply maximizing our position in league tables is the single thing we want to do, because we would have to live by those decisions. Managers don't live by the, by the decisions that they make. The only thing they live by them is what happens to their CV. And the only thing that happens to their, to, to their CV is either KPI has gone up or have they gone down? Did the university get bigger or not? Do they look like good CEOs? That's what matters to them. That's what they live by. We live by the research we have to do when the pressure's on us. And what actually, you know, do we care about our quality research? We'll be making our decisions, yes, living in a dysfunctional, larger national ecosystem. 
but also bearing in mind we're the ones who are doing research and caring about them. I think that makes a difference. But, and I think metrics can be useful uh, in if used in light touch ways, just to measure things a little bit, see how things are going, and then you drop them. You don't keep them going forever. But I also think once a university did this uh, and it went well, which I don't see why it wouldn't if you did it in small steps, like start with this isn't assembly, it becomes a beacon for others to change. And once you change the culture in enough places, the national culture can start to change. So it's a matter of sowing a seed to get to get the ball rolling. Yeah. Um, also, not really fantastic as well. Um, and what, what I wanted to mention was the first referendum, this idea of um, people to get off very better and, and therefore go to a certain way. Um, do you think in a university community, uh, academics are Above that, and, and uh, you know, communities that were kind of uh, bullying pulled over their eyes or uh, alienated from the kind of um, the politics of, of the kind of system that they research in, and uh, also, yeah, such a good example. Um, just, uh, I sent the community, um, the Athenian system of life by having it on a uh, tourism to try to community at uh, mm. the level. Mm. Um, do you think there's that sense of community and um, not tribes, but uh, interpersonal workers within the US system to be able to create uh, to get towards like a, a, a foundation to work with the bottom of the road? Yeah. So, so what one point you said is a sense of community. I, I, I think what this would do is help create a sense of community. Partly because you would be constantly being recycled into meetings with different people from across the university. So we would be siloed off to a lesser extent than, uh, than we are now. Um, I think people within the university who get involved in management don't feel the alienation and don't probably quite understand the alienation of the other people because they're there making decisions and decisions seem fine. You know, they think of all the effort they put into making the decisions, uh, but that's only a small proportion of people. So I think community would be generated by the, by the open democratic process in itself. Do I think academics, are, you know, are particularly good at decision making and immune to the pressures I'm talking about? No, I don't. Um, but I, but I think we, I, I think there's been a rise in careerism, in in the in the sense my real job here, what what I'm what I'm really should be doing is just maximising grant income and general impact factors. I think that has gone up over the last 20, 20 years or so. Uh, and I think that's just not healthy, that, that careerism that's almost become standard now and wasn't before. You know, the, the, the notion of what I'm, what I'm here for is because this is a really interesting question that I, that I want to research. And I'm gonna think about and do some research and just do it because it's absorbing and a uh, useful thing in itself. I, I, I think that has, has has over the last few decades just become less of a concern for them. I mean, it's still there, but careerism is is on the rise, and I and I really you know I really sort of um, anxious and dislike that. So I, I hope this process is a way of reversing that um, that movement, which is actually producing worse decision makers in in academics. Um, because they're buying into a system. A lot of people don't even know the democracy that used to exist from a few decades ago. They're just, they were just born into the system and they've been enculturated by it and they don't know anything different. This, this is my problem. I say, um, there is a sort of community that's going to top down, like, oh, now you're up to get to the next position. It's hopefully being more interesting today. And so, this, this idea of educational love um, and the anti professionalization and anti careerism of um, why. Not, oh, I, I can care now, so there's tools in there. Why should I, what am I doesn't care? What, 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 what's my educational love for this? Yes. 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 I mean, okay, it wouldn't be very difficult, would it, for me to find something like patents, for instance, which would suggest that the modern Western university is more successful in generating true knowledge today than it's ever been. 
patents, like yeah. I mean technology. Technology. We're generating yeah. a lot of food on. Uh, I don't know how much of literature you believe, David. I, 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 I mean, I, over the past 10 years, I just believe less and less and less and less. Of well, it. within our field, maybe. Yeah, but, but, but it's not, but it's not just psychology. I mean, it's, it's practically, I, I mean, the, the whole thing kicked off with an, um, pre-cancer, uh, preclinical cancer biology. Um, I, I suspect the greater the pressures there are uh, for a discipline, um, the worse the situation is going to be, because the more the careerism is, is going to be there, the more the KPIs count. And so I think some of these most most useful areas, like medical and clinical and preclinical, are going to, going to be with some of the worst cases for. But I wonder, you know, if you're going to look at engineering. Engineering, you'll have a right to well, and you know, it's a pretty immediate feedback. Yeah. I'm sure, there are a lot of pressures. Do they not generate more true knowledge than in the past, despite the managerialism that you think? Yeah, I think some some subjects. I, I mean, when I see what physicists are doing, I not not that I'm open to a march, and I mainly know about psychology. I tend to think they're thinking about it the right way. I, I mean, they came up with blind analyses. First, for example, they they put in more checks and balances of the sort of open science that, that we're trying to implement now in, in, in our own discipline, uh, and I and I think that helps. And and uh, so I mean I don't, I don't think that what we've got is is um, is, is complete rubbish, you know, with the credibility crisis. I mean, when you look at these the um, I mean like the twenty fifteen reproducibility project. There was a correlation between the um, the attempted replication and the original effect size. Um, that correlation is there, so the, the the field does have some information in, in it about the truth. That's right. So, so the question is, what's going to maximize um, what's going to maximize the good stuff, the real? So, sure, science has some ability to self correct. Um, you know, it's it's been pointed out that it's not as great as perhaps some people think, but it's there. Um, at least we have some critical tradition where people argue against each other and say um, bad ideas and bad experiments get 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 discovered. How can we make that better? To me, that's the point. I mean, to go back to what I was saying earlier about democracy and science, science did exist and technology did exist in non-democratic situations. Uh, like around about a thousand AD in, in the Middle East. Um, if the critical tradition was encouraged by a caliph, then there was some growth of knowledge. But if the next caliph didn't like it, then it didn't grow again. And China, China was never a democracy, and it had a constant growth of technological knowledge, sometimes a thousand years ahead of the West, often hundreds of years. Inoculations were invented about a thousand AD there, and maybe a bit later, but we picked up the idea from them, and you know, obviously that's been very useful in the last few years. Um, move, movable type printing and so on. But what they had was a steady growth of knowledge and a culture that valued scholarship. Uh, Needham, the biochemist who, who looked at China and, and was utterly amazed by what they had found, did wonder though why the ex exponential growth in knowledge that happened around about 1600 or so in the West. Why did that not happen in China? That became the Needham question. And his, his, his answer was um, they didn't have democracy. So yeah, sure, science can happen uh, without democracy. Uh, knowledge can grow, it can be good stuff. But my point is just put them together and then see what happens. All right, we better move on. So next. So next we have Bolage Axel. Yeah. 
you want coffee, by the way, if you use coffee very well. Yeah. 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 Well, what way is the slide? Where's the slide? Hello. Where is this? You want this one? Yeah. Uh, it's just shared. Yeah. Oh, I see. Well, let me try. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, here. Right. Okay. Pretty interesting. <laughs> Right, let's uh, let's go back. Just, just yeah, go to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Getting there. Mm -hmm. Maybe we want to have this shot. Good. All right. It's working now. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Balaj Atiel, and I will talk about the multi-analyst approach, which uh, stems from something connected to these uh, issues in science, but uh, on a different dimension. Maybe there's something that we, we didn't discover because it's not part of a tradition to look into uh, two myth that I want to start with. It's all about traditional data analysis that uh, in most of the papers, empirical papers you find, there's usually one analyst analyzing one data set, getting to one conclusion. And in the traditional peer review system, what happens is the reviewers go to the steps of the analysis and they uh, try to verify whether these are legitimate steps. But I think, and then it's published, so, when uh, they say that it is uh, correct. And, and of course, there are other conditions as well. And we assume that if it was unbiased data set and there was a legitimate analysis, then this is the conclusion to the question that uh, the, the, the study had. And um, I think there are two myths behind this assumption. One is that there's always a uniquely appropriate analytical path for a given data set. Another one is that another analyst would have come up with the same analysis if uh, properly skilled in statistics and understands the theory. So as, as you all know that in every uh, data analysis, there are several steps throughout um, how we start from raw data, we get to conclusion. But um, this is often, uh, one of the path in the, we call it analytical space. So in fact, uh, when we go and look into the individual choices, often we can realize that there are alternative options as well as the analyst could go through. But the big question I think is whether that path that you took is representative of the analytical space? Is it the answer to the question? This is the conclusion, or it can be that this is just a peripheral or a accidental conclusion that you arrived to. And maybe for if you took many other paths, maybe you would have arrived to a very different answer. From that path, we don't know. From the peer review system, we don't know. Even if everything was correct and the analyst had the best intention and the best data set and, and did everything correctly, still we don't know whether we're just missing alternative conclusions as well. I'll, I'll talk uh, about more to understand. But I, I brought uh, Yelte Wicher's uh, uh, paper that lists huge number of 
options or, or called freedom of analytical space where analysts can can make alternative choices, models, uh, uh, pre-processing of the data, for example, or or uh, discarding outliers or taking frequentist of Bayesian approach. So the, the, often there are no objective ways of telling, uh, mentioning outlier exclusion, whether uh, what, what counts as, as uh, the, the right level of exclusion. Uh, but uh, we, we just don't know whether a different different um, outlier uh, preprocessing method would have arrived to slightly different re uh, result. And this is just about talking about one choice, and there are several choices throughout the analysis. Um, so, so how can we tackle this issue? One, one way is um, so-called multiverse analysis, where one analyst just take uh, all, all the possible approaches to the, to the data set. It, it, it does happen in, in some traditional data analysis that they do some sensitivity analysis. So they, they check a few things, but their intention is they're not to explore the whole analytical space. It's the, if their intention is to explore the whole analytical space, that's, that's what we call multiverse analysis. Well, one analyst uh, or a team of analysts can, can do that. But uh, one downside is that this is still the team that is the most interested in to get one kind of result. So you can give the impression um, that, that there are, you explored analytical space, but you can give that just exploring that area or, or pres presenting that area that supports your hypothesis. So one way to, and, and also one, one more um, uh, possible uh, criticism of the multiverse analysis is that, for example, if, if you have a particular um, approach to statistics, you, you like your frequentist, you, you might not ever try Bayesian approach and your be multiverse um, exploration won't uh, take, take that perspective as a Bayesian analyst would do, for example. So, so even if in multiverse, the analyst can show a lot of results that will still reflect the approach to statistics or that data set or that theory from that particular analyst or, or team of analysts. So when you take multiple um, analysts, so independent analysts in your project, so uh, you have to imagine that you, there's a data set and you ask different teams or, or, or different analysts to try to analyze, to find answer to the same question from the same data set. So um, one benefit of this approach is that if the conclusions converge, then I assume that you should have an increased confidence that may maybe that we are um, finding the right answer. Um, if they diverge, then it opens a lot of questions that maybe uh, you would have missed if there was only one analyst analyzing uh, the data set. Uh, you can find out maybe uh, there was some coding error, for example, that um, if you if you put the different analyses uh, next to each other, then you might uh, find why one diverged. And but the reason why uh, you find different results can be also that there is just so much freedom in the analytical space that uh, allows different conclusions. So there have been um, demonstrations of this multi-analyst approach, um, different studies. It's, it's around 12 in the world when it was really dedicated multi-analyst approach that they took one data set and the independent teams tried to analyze the same one. Uh, I brought you, you one, if you are not familiar with what uh, Nick Nezer and colleagues, had one fMRI data set, and they gave this one to 70 independent teams to analyze. Um, and uh, the, the surprising finding was that if I know two teams uh, that followed the same workflow, 
in in the analysis and and uh, there were sizable variations in the results so the conclusions uh, were, were, were different obviously it can't be 70 different conclusions but still uh, each of them could have been published because the, probably they would have passed the peer review because each, each of the steps are legitimate they are within the tradition of fMRI data analysis but we would have a different conclusion different uh, parameters, different statistical results uh, in that publication. So when, when there is a question, uh, then and there is an answer from one analyst or a, one team, then the question is whether we should trust that this is the answer. Interestingly, when the uh, in the height of the COVID pandemic um, in the UK. Uh, um, they wanted to calculate the R index, the reproducibility index of uh, COVID virus, and they gave the data set to nine independent teams. They didn't want to do multi analysis. They, for some reason, they, they invited nine experts, and they, they came up with, they all came up with different estimates of R index. Some of them uh, was below one, so, so the, the the spread is de decreasing, others had a higher increasing. And, and they looked into it and they said, no one made a mistake. It is just, you can use different models. But uh, you can imagine if, if you, they ask only one team, then, then the policymakers would thought that uh, this is a, an expert um, opinion on, on, on the data set. And so th this is the fact. But the fact is that just even, even for things like, um, our index, it is still gives a lot of freedom to analysts to, to um, analyze the, the data differently. And that, that brings up, I think, um, fundamental, maybe philosophical questions of what, what to, can we conclude from data sets. Um, so um, my uh, impression is that in, in, in the last, um, 10 years or so, we, there was a lot of attention of fraud and questionable research practices, where it's obviously there is something wrong in the system and people uh, try to cheat or they don't know statistics or they use uh, bias samples and so on. But I think there's an implicit assumption if they just, if they were transparent, if they had high power samples and, and so on, then uh, we could trust the results. But, uh, but that's, that's a huge question, I think, that whether this analytical variability still brings in a lot of uh, questions, whether we should take that conclusion from a study where this conclusion is inferred from uh, um, by one analytical um, team or analyst uh, following one analytical path, whether we can assume that this is the only answer or there could have been very different uh, results. So I, I emphasize conclusions, but if you talk about, for example, effect sizes, when people do, um, um, do um, estimates of uh, overall effect sizes of, of effects in meta-analyses, then, then they take it for granted what uh, one team came up in, in a published study, but it could have been a different estimate, even if the conclusions were different, uh, were the same from, from a different lab. So there's a lot of uh, idiosyncratic, uh, um, let me um, properties of, of uh, the analysis as, as we are in the tradition today trying to multitask here. So uh, in a team, we came up with a guidance of how uh, multi-analyst studies should uh, or could be uh, conducted. So the idea is that in order to give more confidence to the reader that this is the conclusion, or at least we explored uh, what we can tell from one data set, then it would be uh, wise to invite independent analysts, especially when the question is theoretically important or, or, or uh, it has social impact or um, for any other reasons, it, it should be important to know um, the, whether that statistical result or conclusion is um, the 
answer to the question from that data set. So th that sounds like extra work uh, to not, not just do the job yourself, but uh, to work with others independently. But uh, I believe that uh, the, the choice is whether we just try to ignore the fact that there could have been other results and maybe ours is just one of the ad hoc uh, options of, of the, all, all the possibilities, or we, we put more effort in it. With, with this guidance, we try to reuse that effort uh, that uh, multi-analyst uh, project can, can be that it's just three teams independently analyzing the data or the, uh, can establish some robustness of uh, whether that um, particular result was incidental or it um, converges with other analyst uh, insights. So uh, this guidance gave advice on how to recruit a co-analyst, how to provide a data set, a research question, um, how, how, how to conduct independent analysis, process the data, and, and importantly, how do we report results that uh, come from different analyses. We also provide uh, a checklist and also a template of how uh, this kind of uh, multi-analyst projects can, can be reported. But um, as, as I mentioned, that is just the assumption that this is an issue. Those studies that I listed, are, I think these are mostly demonstrative projects. They maybe picked those data sets because they suspected that uh, analysts might disagree. So we want uh, now uh, find out whether this is really the case in social sciences, whether social science is full of uh, results that could have been different if uh, we had a different analyst there. So if we, we take a time machine, if we went back uh, to the uh, time when the already now published studies were analyzed. If we changed the analysts to, to another person, would we now have a different paper? That's um, the question we asked in the, this project we call it Multi 100. So we, we have 100 papers that uh, we collaborate with the Center for Open Science in the SCORE project. They, they um, I took a random sample of, from social sciences from the last 10 years, 100 papers. And from for each of the study, we picked one result and we asked five independent teams. That's 500 analysts um, that uh, sounded, uh, sounded already ambitious, but now I think we spent two years uh, uh, conducting it. And now we have 492 analysis. <laughs> uh, so I hope within weeks we will complete the, the whole study. And um, the big question will be whether uh, the new results are in line with the original results. And um, so this is just a made, made up uh, graph, but uh, right now I have new slides with some preliminary results. So that this could be uh, the case that for some of the studies, all of the uh, new analyses are in line with the original ones, and and some of them are not. Um, so, how how what's the state of social sciences? Is it more uh, that different analysts come up with the same conclusions, or 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 for most of them there are alternative uh, ways to conclude as well? Also, we uh, calculate effect sizes for for each. Um, of the, the new analysis and we try to um, find enough uh, uh, in statistics in the original papers to, to produce really No, this is already made up. And said, we don't have the APEX size yet. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, this is very preliminary. So, uh, we will be there in weeks, but uh, so this uh, graph is just uh, plainly shows that uh, all of the original uh, results claim the uh, evidence for an effect. The new analyses, 71% uh, uh, shows evidence for the original one, but the rest of them don't. 
So these, in, in, on, in these cases, the, the new analysts found no evidence for, for that, taking it, uh, um, the best approach. So in the multi-analyst approach, the analyst tries to take the best. Not in multiverse can can uh, try uh, any kind of uh, path, but uh, if if our analysts took the best uh, of the, their knowledge, uh, according to their knowledge, the best path, then uh, more more than one quarter of the results uh, show no evidence, or some patients uh, found evidence for uh, the opposite effect. And um, that that's about conclusions. But when uh, question was. Uh, whether it came, they came up with the same statistical results is uh, fairly similar. Around one quarter of the results are, are uh, statistically different. In, in this one, we call it task two. Um, we gave them more specific instructions that would um, kind of narrow down their analytical path um, or analytical um, task to the very same question is as it was in the original paper. They try to explain. So often uh, there is some big uh, overall uh, question in, in the paper, but in the particular analysis, they uh, just select um, one group or or they they use one kind of model or one kind of uh, theory to to test this question, and therefore it can explain why our results are different because uh, uh, they narrowed down their question in the analysis. So uh, for task two, we narrowed down their question uh, to uh, be in line with the, the original paper's uh, narrower scope. And, and there, then we checked whether they come up with the same statistical results or not. The result is uh, the picture is very similar. So it's about, one uh, quarter not not in line again i emphasize these are very preliminary results we will uh, complete the uh, i call it data collection but basically this is an analysis collection um within weeks and we, we try to um try to write it up uh, uh, in the summer if i had that but um yeah so um, I started from the question whether this is a, a case for social sciences that uh, different analytical paths matter. And uh, now for uh, in this multi 100 projects, even if it's only 100 uh, uh, papers from, from all social sciences, uh, it's, a, it's a representative set. It's, it's not huge. But um, I think it's a, a gigantic effort to work with 500 independent analysts. Um, well, I think we can definitely say that uh, there is evidence that it does matter. Um, it, in certain fields, it might matter more than in other fields. But um, I think it, it is uh, already enough to question whether just having the conclusion from one, one analyst is, even if everything else is uh, on top quality and, and unbiased, then uh, we should uh, just assume that this is the only answer to, to the question from that data set. So this is what I brought today. Thanks for your attention. Questions? Did your uh, analysts know the original conclusion and the original method? Yes, uh, so originally we thought we just give them the data set and the question, but it comes with a lot of uh, potential issues. One is that they don't understand the theory. They don't understand the context of, of the original paper. Therefore, we thought we give them just the introduction of the original paper. But it turns out that I'm a psychologist in psychology, we have introduction, methods, results. So we can just take out introduction. But in uh, some fields such as economics, uh, they, they have it uh, all together. They already discussed the re results in the introduction. And so it's a, it was impossible to differentiate. And, and out of all the options we found the best is to give them original papers. So they have approach or they have access to the context. Yes, they might be biased, 
by knowing the original uh, analytical approach, we emphasize that they just uh, take what they think is the best. Uh, so if anything, this is an underestimate of the issue because it could, some might took the easy way and just uh, repeated the original uh, analytical uh, approach that was in the paper, but- um, Well, I see it as a challenge. Yes. Very different stuff. Yes, so some found it, they uh, want to prove that uh, they know it better, but uh, it's unavoidable. Yes. So uh, I guess this uh, um, this one is a, is a merged uh, yeah. result of mm -hmm. all the uh, five hundred mm -hmm. analysis. But uh, do you have any insights on the proportion of not uh, yet? No, okay. Not yet. What like, we will have? Yeah. The, the thing is, you you might say, okay, twenty three percent of uh, results are not in line with the original one, but mm. there are some like. Uh, there is an order like you 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 have some analysis which have like four yeah. or five yeah like this like all yes five. so it could so you mean about the the proportion of the papers yeah uh, that uh, they're, they're fully all five of the yes. uh, analysis are in no mind. this this is just um, uh, not taking it into account uh, whether they belong to one paper or or not right. but uh, of course we will have more detailed. Uh, exploration and what would you say is the threshold to say maybe it's not so um, um, trustable like uh, what is the, for example if you say only two of the uh, reanalysis mm -hmm. are, are in line is that a a but I, one or what, what would you say to that yes so I think one, one question is quality control, whether those that had different results, whether they just uh, made a mistake in the calculation or, or that there is uh, acceptable analysis. Of course, it's always a question, but I think the, what we should get used to is that just from one study, we should not expect the answer that can be, gives you, it narrows down the possibilities. And then follow-up studies can then take, take this one and maybe uh, make more accurate uh, predictions of the theory or, or explore uh, why certain uh, parameter change make difference and, and so on. So that makes the process longer, but may, maybe more trustworthy. To the yes. Hi, Karina. Hello, I'm just sharing my screen now. Does that look good? Yep, that's good. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. I'm Karina Logan. I'm a researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Germany. And I'm going to share with you a part of a webinar I gave for Reproducible Research Oxford. It's the part that talks about peer community in which Rob so eloquently introduced. And so there are a couple of sections that are a bit repetitive with what he talks about, but hopefully reviewing will be good at this point because registry reports are new for a lot of people and PCIRR is really new for a lot of people. So um, it's a 13 minute video and then I'll open it up for particular questions that people have. I have a lot more information I could share, just a matter of what do you wanna know? So we can tailor it after that. Can't you, you can't hear the video? We didn't hear the video. We can't hear the video. At all? Not at all. The volume on the video is completely up. Um, let me see if... Sharing screens here. Um, when you click on the share screen arrow, you can click on share audio as well. Oh, thank you so much. I see that now. Great. I will do that. Let's go back just a little bit. Um, to 
here. This is saying that I will not judge people, select people based on metrics. I was like, it's on and then here. So, okay, how about this? On that quick overview, I want to jump now into the ethical model that can address all the problems that we've encountered in the exploitative route of publishing. And that is peer community in. So it's a journal style peer review where there's an editor and at least two reviewers of a preprint that's hosted at a preprint server. So if it's accepted, then PCI publishes the peer review history on their website and the authors update the article at the preprint server and that's the peer review version. Now, um, PCI is not a journal, so you can then submit this peer review preprint to a journal and ask to have the, an additional peer review waived. Um, PCI is a researcher run nonprofit organization and they publish their economic model online. So you can see how much money they make from where, it's all um, donations and where they spend the money as well. But the cool part is, so it's free for readers, it's free for authors. It's, it's, it costs almost nothing to run. So uh, there's a, for each PCI, so there's a PCI, you can make a PCI in an area that you don't see one. So there's a PCI in evolutionary biology, a PCI in ecology, paleontology, et cetera. Um, and if you want to have a PCI in your area, just you can make one. Um, but each PCI costs about 500 euros per year, and that's just for the website hosting and development. And then if you want to go and include travel expenses for promoting your PCI, you can. I don't um, because I just do it as part of my everyday life. Um, so it, it's really cheap to do the peer review of, of articles. So PCI already existed. and. And uh, there was something missing, and that was registered reports. And so one of the great things about PCI is, is that if you have an innovation and you want to implement it, you can. And so I and some co-founders um, founded PCI in registered reports. So first, let me walk through what a registered report is for those who don't know. Um, so you have a study plan, and you get that pre-study peer review before you conduct your study. And if it passes the peer review there, then you get an in-principle acceptance. So you're basically guaranteed to have the post-study um, write-up accepted, given that you follow your plan. So then you get your in-principle acceptance, you conduct your study, you write the preprints, and then um, you submit it again for post-study peer review. And they just check to make sure that you followed your plan and that you're not overstating your results and conclusions. And then you have the final preprint. Now, register reports as an article type began in 2013. Chris Chambers implemented it at um, the journal Cortex. And he's one of the co-founders of PCIR, which is pretty exciting for me. Um, so, and, and the point here is, is to address a paradox. So, which part of a research study do you believe should be beyond your control as a scientist? So like, is that the intro, the methods, the results, or the discussion? The correct answer is results. Um, but then which part of a research study do you believe is most important for advancing your career? And fortunately, that's also the results. And what's best for research in this case, which is not to touch the results, um, is in competition then with what's best for researchers in terms of producing lots of great results. And so the register report format can really address this um, because of the, there are a number of other questionable research practices that come up um, when we put researchers under pressure to get great results. So it can result in lack of replication, low statistical power, selective reporting in multiple places, publication bias, lack of data sharing, and changing the hypothesis after you have your results. So the solution is to make results a dead currency in the evaluation of research quality, which results uh, register reports does. So peer community and register reports, we started it because we didn't have a, there was nothing out there that had everything we wanted uh, that we wanted to innovate for registered reports. So we made a peer community and registered reports and we went nuts on innovations and we're still doing innovations. I mean, I'm just really excited about this because it's opening up the world of registered reports to more fields, um, qualitative uh, research, um, you know, people, it's not just for science, it's for, it's for everyone. So um, six innovations that we made um, we're offering programmatic register reports. So 
one stage one registry report, the pre-study um, write-up, can lead to many stage two manuscripts. So you might have one theory that you're using to test a variety of different experiments. And so instead of writing one registry report for each of these experiments, you just write one registry report and then um, you can have multiple articles resulting from this one. So that saves time. Another time saver is you can schedule the review process. So if you submit a one page snapshot, um, at least six weeks before when you want to submit your, your full stage one uh, report, we'll schedule the reviewers in advance and so they can turn around the, the peer review time faster. Um, we actually train our editors, which we call recommenders. Um, they have to pass a test to, um, to be able to handle the registered reports at PCIRR. Uh, to my knowledge, no other journal, no journal offers this. Um, so we thought it was really important and people are uh, responding really well to it and appreciating the education. Um, so the peer review is in, undertaken independently of a journal. And the cool part here is that if you, you, you can leave your peer reviewed pre-registration, your peer reviewed preprint at the preprint server, it's peer reviewed, or you can submit it to a journal if you want to. And um, at, at PCIRR, we have about 20, what we call PCIRR friendly journals, where they will automatically accept your um, anything accepted by PCIRR. So if you want it to go into one of these 20 journals, um, you can. But here, instead of shopping your register report around to all these different journals, and some of them don't even offer register reports, then you just get the peer review happening in one place. It saves a lot of reviewer time. And then you choose the journal you want to put it in, if you want to put it in the journal. The authors can choose whether the reviewers must sign the reviews or whether it's optional. Some journals uh, require that all, like F1000 Research requires that all reviewers have to sign. And so if you know in advance that you want to target a particular journal, you can align the PCI RR review process with your target. Um, and we explicitly state and address the level of bias in, our, in the register report with the taxonomy of bias control, which I'll tell you about uh, a bit more in a minute. So how it works is that you put your register report at a repository, you submit the URL to your register report at the PCIRR website, it undergoes peer review, you revise and resubmit, and, and eventually it likely gets um, recommended, which is accepted. Um, then you conduct your study, you put your preprint at a preprint server, so your final write-up. You submit that URL to PCIRR, it undergoes peer review, revisions, and then um, it's recommended. And the cool part about PCI is where you, the editor writes recommendation text about why, like how this process went for this article and what is the interesting thing about this article. It's actually really cool. It's like a, rec it's like a letter of recommendation for, your, for each article. I found it actually useful. Um, so it's recommended, you update your article at the preprint server and it links to your, um, peer review history and recommendation, which is citable, and you can then submit it to a journal if you like. We select based on scientific validity and not subjective impact. So here's the um, level of taxonomy, level of bias taxonomy that I wanted to show you, and I'll show you this through um, the, the recommender test, the editor test we have our editors go through. Um, this is one of the questions on the test, and, and so let us just walk through this. So suppose that PCIRR receives a stage one manuscript proposing a study in which the data that will be used to answer the question have been accessed and partially observed by the authors. The authors also certify that they have not yet sufficiently observed the key variables within the data set to be able to answer the question. Is this submission likely to be eligible for consideration? Yes, provided additional steps are taken to control risk of bias, or no, the risk of bias in this scenario is too high for PCIRR. Well, the correct answer is yes, we can, we can handle that because we have this, um, these levels of bias and you just have to declare what your level of bias is. So level six is where the data do not exist at all before you get pre-study acceptance. So you haven't conducted the study, you have nothing, no data to, to look at at all. And then if you're down here at, at level one, um, you've, you've got data collected, you've seen the results like think about it in terms of like a long-term study right you've got a long-term database data are coming in year after year after year and you've seen like the large columns of maybe 10,000 rows of data um, 
and if the data is there, but maybe you have a new hypothesis you want to ask of this data set. You can do that as long as you haven't done the analysis you're proposing to do yet. So you, um, as long as you haven't done that, then you can have a registered report and um, just declare your bias level to be one. So if at any point, like let's say I submit my registered report at level six, I haven't collected any data yet, but I have this like non negotiable start date for data collection. My birds, their breeding season stops and I've got to start collecting data now. Um, then I just notify uh, the editor at PCIRR or what level I'm dropping down to, my submission is dropping down to. And so this can be uh, really useful for a variety of uh, making registered reports more flexible for people. Okay, so changing to an inclusive model for academia. Well, we need to make things free to read and publish. We need to implement anti-racist, anti-sexist policies, and we need to actively recruit based on potential, not prestige. And we're doing that at PCIR through recruiting articles based on registered reports, so their potential, not prestige, because there are no results associated with the registered reports when we accept them. It's free to read and publish at PCI, and at PCIRR, I've been implementing, uh, so I took, I assigned myself the role of being in charge of recruiting the editors and the managing board. And what I've been doing is testing out ideas for how I can implement anti-racist, anti-sexist policies. So some of the things we've been doing are um, inviting people from groups who are traditionally underrepresented in academia first finding what I call invisible people. So I've discovered that people in a lot of countries who are faculty at universities, the universities don't necessarily have a tradition of putting their faculty on, their, on the university website. And a lot of these faculty don't have Google Scholar profiles and don't list themselves in databases. And so how do you find these people? You know, it's been this, it takes me a lot of time to find just 10 people to invite, but it's been so worth it and just eye-opening in terms of um, differences in, in how academia works in different countries. Um, I invite people in batches, so only when a batch has diversity do I then um, send out the invitations. And we emphasize that we'll train and help people with uh, English when requested. So I've worked in Spanish and in German, which are not my native languages, and I know how hard it is to do that. And so the, the, the idea that we would discriminate against people because they aren't native English speakers is, um, is another way that biases can really um, creep in. And so uh, my goal right now is to strive for a majority minority, which is kind of a ridiculous thing to say because the main, <laughs> what we're talking about, the minority in academia, are actually the majority of people in the world. It's just academia that has this selection funnel. Um, so these are some of the things we're doing at PCIRR, and um, I'd love to open things up for discussion right now and um, yeah, see what you Okay, so that was the uh, video part. Uh, I will say we are up to 29 PCI RR friendly journals and 73 recommenders, but we are in need of a lot more recommenders. So if anyone is interested in becoming a PCIRR recommender or knows people who are, please get in contact. Our website is rr.peercommunityin.org. So I'd love to hear um, what questions you have and um, what you might wanna learn more about. I could share my screen, show you some things on the website, um, whatever you'd like to do from here. Hey Zoltan, are you there? I'm hey, like, yeah. okay, good. I just don't hear anything. <laughs> Maybe it's a fairly knowledgeable audience about PCI, one guess. We have some recommenders here. Yeah, that's great. 
I think we're up to 30, by the way, the Calabra in Transitland. Oh, right. Yeah, the, um, I wonder if the website isn't updated for that uh, that number yet. Yeah, good okay, point. You said, you said 20 before, that shows how, how quickly it's growing. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions? In the chat there. Yeah, there's some chat there. Um, can you see the chat? Yep, no questions in the chat. All right. I just think everyone's convinced. <laughs> Anybody want to say uh, yeah, Robert has a question. I, I got a question for you, Karina. I, I, I wonder, I mean, I you focused there on the PCI friendly journals. I'd be interested if you could talk a little bit about how the PCI interested journals are working. How often do um you know, I understand there's a system whereby those journals can effectively bid on papers. I'm just wondering how often that ever happens. Yeah, interesting question, Rob, because um, I was just uh, seeing some tweets about um, one of our authors and they were thinking of going with a particular PCIR friendly journal, um, which, of which in their field they had multiple options, but actually a collaborative psychology um, approached them. They were PCI or interested at the time and they approached the authors. They, um, so for everyone else, how it works is that when we have recommended articles, um, an email automatically gets sent out to all of the editors at these PCI or interested journals. And so these are journals that have signed up to say, hey, I'm not going to automatically accept PCIRR recommended journals, but I am interested in knowing what they are. And so they receive these notifications. And so through one of these notifications, um, authors were approached by one of the PCIRR interested journals and asked if they could they could have the articles. So then the authors were like, well, let's see who else might approach us. Um, and uh, maybe we'll have even more choices. Um, and they, I think they decided to end up going with uh, collaborative psychology. So um, in terms of how often people are approached, I can't really say after we, um, after we recommend the final article, we don't necessarily get a lot of feedback from the authors, um, but we are tracking where the, um, articles, if they get published in a journal, which journals they're published in. So um, I haven't looked at those numbers recently, so I'm not sure like what percentage are PCI interested versus friendly. Yeah, I, I, I just wonder with the PCI interested journals, allowing whether they should even be allowed to select from stage two manuscripts, because it provides another possible source, uh, you know, for, for bias to come back in. Whereby that you know they're they're now select making their publication decision on the basis of results being known, um, mm -hmm. and I, you know it seems like within the spirit of PCI RR that or in, within the spirit of registered reports in general mm -hmm. that an interested journal should need to commit at stage one mm -hmm. um, before the, the results are known. Yeah, that's an interesting question because a PCI interested category is a is a category that goes across all PCIs and. And um, so we've had to modify a lot of things specifically for PCIRR. Basically, like once the preprint is recommended by PCIRR, like it's off of our radar, so the authors can do whatever they want. But that is a good um, that's a good point. I can bring it up with the managing board. Yeah, I think it's a good point. Of course, it'd be hard to tell someone if nature human behavior. I believe or someone told me they were NHP, so they'll take them up on that. Um, no, but I, I see no reason why we should just assist that NHP makes us offer at stage one. But, but this isn't the decision, I mean, this isn't the decision between something being publicly available and published versus not publicly I mean, if the journal doesn't make it like it's still on the public, well. Uh, yeah. In situations where people would go through the review process, get a recommendation from PCIRR, 
and then just not publish it in a journal, just put it as a preprint and leave it there? Um, you know, I don't know if that's actually happened yet. I think most people right now are going for journals. Um, and certainly it's an option. I know across all PCIs, other that does happen at some other PCIs um, that people are not choosing to put uh, the preprint in the, the peer review preprint in the journals. I think one of the issues is that the preprint servers really vary in how good they are at announcing that this is a peer reviewed preprint. And like at BioArchive, for example, there is this statement that says this is not peer reviewed and they won't change that even if it is peer reviewed. So um, there can be some tricky angles there, um, but I think that's changing and that we're starting to work more with preprint servers to get that language um, in line with what we can do at, across the PCIs. Um, so yes, it does happen at some PCIs. I don't yet know the rate at which it happens at PCIRR. But also encouraging the ones to set up their own PCI community and different disciplines, both the psychology, you know, metric psychology, whatever you publish in, so you have this available to you, not just to register reports, but look for other articles, right? So you don't have to go through the normal system. You go to the peer, peer community and website, you don't really have to set up in the community. Anybody want to say anything at all before we? Before we close, getting by late now. So, any final points? Well, great. Thanks. Thanks all for coming. Um, yes. <laughs> we'll probably be having some drinks now, maybe found a bar if anyone wants to join us um, and see you all about. Thanks, Sultan. Cheers. Cheers. See you later. See you, Rob. See you, Karina. Bye. <laughs>